Hello, Steve Davis here with a quick note before we start this episode proper. If you're a regular listener or a new listener, I thought we'd just better point out that what you're about to hear in this episode is very different from the usual format we follow because we have a special guest. Mick from Pomegranate Health joins us. We are co-sharing this episode and what you'll hear is his approach to telling the stories of medicine with his uh, particular narrative format. And likewise, we are going to be joining his current episode of Pomegranate Health. But for now, we hope you enjoy this alternate approach to capturing the stories and the spirit of medical podcasting. Welcome to This Medical Life Podcast. These are the stories of medicine with Steve Davis and Dr. Travis Brown. This is a story with Pomegranate Health Podcast. Dr. Travis Brown, do you ever have a sense that there's company lurking in the wings as we record an episode. Are you saying am I paranoid? I'm always paranoid. Aren't you paranoid? I'm talking to both of you. <laughs> Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> That's what I mean. Exactly. Okay. So, yes, yes, uh, but sometimes the paranoia is correct. It is. And let me introduce the voice behind the paranoia. Mick Cavazzini is a journalist and audio geek who's passionate about engaging people with ethics, health and the natural world. He produces Pomegranate Health, which is a podcast with the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and won an Australian Podcast Award in 2018. Mick has a background in neuroscience and is associated with the University of Sydney. He's worked as a research scientist at Oxford and ANU, where he investigated how brain cells process information and learning. He's also written for The Medical Republic, Australian Doctor and The Canberra Times. Mick is our guest today on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome, Mick. Thank you so much. What an introduction. Where did that name come from? I always get asked that question, and actually for the eight years that I've worked at the College of Physicians, I only had half the picture. Um, I did know that the pomegranate fruit appears on the crest, on the college crest, alongside an emu and a kiwi. Um, I don't know what flightless birds say about medicine, but <laughs> the, but the pomegranate does have some history. So the RACP was founded in 1938, but prior to that, Australian physicians were members of the Royal College of Physicians London, which on its crest has an arm reaching down with an ermine cuff out of a cloud, holding the wrist of another arm and feeling its pulse, pulse of the patient. And below them sits a golden pomegranate. Um, this is described in the 1546 grant, um, grant of arms filed with the official College of Arms, and that the, f- the physician's hand is, quote, failing the poles, and below that is a pomegranate gold, a golden pomegranate. But there's no explanation as to why. Um, I did find a 1992 article from the former editor of the RCP's journal that says, happily for speculators, there is no record why the college chose its particular coat of arms. Um, The symbolism of the pomegranate illustrated in the grant as an unrecognisable blob has recently exercised the minds of our Australian colleagues. Mick, I've got to ask, though, that the way you describe that with the arm reaching down, it's like J.R.R. Tolkien. Absolutely. Came up with a mythical (laughs) symbol that would yield novels. It does look quite mystical when you look at the the RCP's um, crest. Um, So the crest... So where does the crest come from? As as you guys have covered in, in the podcast... The Royal College of Physicians was founded by none other than King Henry VIII in 1518. Um, I very, uh, I very much enjoyed your, your story about his transition from a <laughs> strong Charles Hemworth type character to an erratic 150 kilos. Um, so the pomegranate actually came into English heraldry through his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon, um, eight oh. years eight years before the RCP was founded. Um, it's known as the the pomegranate, the, the seeded apple. 
so she had this, this was presumably part of Spanish heraldry, and on marrying Henry, she took uh, the pomegranate with a crown on it as her, as her badge, and there are various depictions of the, bom- the pomegranate and the English rose entwined. It was, it was quite a fairy tale wedding at the time. So you might think that the College of Physicians was honouring Henry and his, and his popular wife. The problem is that the RCP only filed its blazon with the Royal College of Arms in 1546, which is several years after Henry's uh, divorce from Catherine. You might have heard of it um, in 1533 <laughs> when the uh, Church of England was invented so that Henry could divorce his wife. Um, Steve, you, I'm sure you know the, the mnemonic divorced, beheaded, something, 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 something. Oh, divorced. I just saw the uh, <laughs> musical stage play that's right, going yeah. around called Six, and uh, no, I can't, they sang it all the way through. I just tapped, <laughs> I tapped my toes. I didn't lose my head over it. <laughs> wasn't wasn't uh, required learning. Um, so what's going on with the RCP? Why this? You know, yes. the, so the article I, was, I read suggests, quote, the physicians of 1546 would not have been so rash as to purposely remind the irascible Henry of his first wife. Um, so they, they speculate that maybe the arms were sitting in a drawer for a couple oh. of decades until the college finally submitted it for a grant, which um, for members of the RACP would uh, strike as somewhat familiar. <laughs> but still, okay, but still, why? What is the symbolism of the pomegranate? Um, there is an explainer in the British Medical Journal because they also used it for a, a conference. And it indicates how in Christian art, the pomegranate is often used as a symbol of resurrection, of everlasting life, often in portrayals of the Virgin Mary and child. So it's a portent of, you know, rebirth. There, um, it, uh, it appears in Persian myth, um, the, the warrior Isfandiar, eats a pomegranate and becomes invincible. In, Juda- in Judaism, there are said to be 613 pomegranate seeds, one for each commandment in the Talmud. And possibly this all goes back to Greek myth. Um, Persephone was married to her abductor Hades <coughs> um, by eating a few pomegranate seeds. Um, so that may be a symbol of, of the contract of marriage, but also the the fact that when she her mother persephone's mother demeter intervened to get persephone back um this became the the cycle of rebirth that she would spend half the year in the underworld and then come back to the to earth during springtime so this this idea of reincarnation and fertility probably started there Um, Mm -hmm. and maybe there are some um well not pseudoscientific maybe some real scientific um, origins of you know its role as an antioxidant or antihypertensive that may have sparked those ideas. Now, on your show, you've clicked over a hundred episodes. So, congratulations! That's a, that's an amazing effort. We can we can certainly understand. <laughs> Uh, there is a, a number of questions we'll ask you about specific episodes, but there was one which you, you started doing some research on and took you down sort of a, I, I think it's described as a rabbit hole of uh, opioid use throughout history, sort of a, a this medical life-esque type uh, escapade. I'd say a rabbit den. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so can you tell us a little bit about the history of, of what you found out about opioid use? Yeah, so this was in 2019, actually, um, early in my role at the college. I did a couple of episodes on opioids um, and uh, spoke to some addiction medicine specialists about pres- real-time prescription monitoring and, and de-prescribing. Um, but for fun, I framed some of each of the chapters with a historical quote because, like you, I was fascinated by this long... Um, this long history that sort of influences the way we think about them today. Um, And it's a real treat to be able to expand on that with with you guys. A a lot of the early references to to opioids come from the Sumerians and the Egyptians. Um, Almost every paper tells you that the the Sumerians were the first to cultivate opium poppies some 3,000 years before Christ. Um, 
although this is a little bit grey and, and, and I question some of the scholarship of the people that use this story. The, uh, in, in the 1927 writings of a Brit British physician in Persia, um, we're told that it's referred to by the Sumerians as the joy plant, Hulgil. Um, but I found a more scholarly article from 1975 that goes back to the original Sumerian pictograms and questions the, the translation. Um, he thinks that they're more likely to be talking about a cucumber. <laughs> uh, oh. but that's, there's, but, there's joy in cucumbers? As well, as well. <laughs> um, but it's a persistent story and it's, sort of, it's something you come across a lot in, in scientific writing that, you know, some, someone grabs something written in a review and then that becomes the popular, uh, you know, source, even though it might not be correct. Um, but yeah, the, the, perhaps the attribu Egyptian attributions are a bit more thorough. There's a papyrus called the Ebers papyrus dating to about 1500 years before Christ. The English translation, which I presume has influenced most scholars, dates back to 1930. So a lot of the early translations of these ancient texts come from German um, uh, science, uh, archaeologists. And this was a 1890 German e Egyptologist called Henrich Joachim. Um, who described it as, as this. Uh, in a foreword to chapter 7, he, he tells you about the crazy concoction, concoctions he's found in this Egyptian text. Human excrement mixed with yeast of sweet beer and honey is recommended as dressing for wounds. To cure abscesses, you can use man's milk reinforced by tortoise shell and granite. Or to drive out the Nezit disease, I'm not sure what that is, Take two testicles of a black ass, crush, rub in wine, and let the patient drink. The disease disappears at once. <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. So a few random concoctions, but if we stick to op opium, there's a treatment for, for grey eyebrows. Steve, can you tell us how that goes? Which includes crocodile earth mixed with honey, dissolved in onion water, or ass's liver warmed in oil with opium, rolled into little balls and rubbed in. So, so yes, the Egyptians might have um, written about opium, but it might be a little generous to say that the Egyptian physicians had mastered the pharmaceutical <laughs> properties of opium, given that it was uh, rubbed in. Um, there is another remedy to stop the crying of a child, which might be a bit more plaus plausible. Pods of the poppy plant, fly dirt, which is on the wall, mix together, strain, and take for four days. It acts at once. And this reminds me a little of uh, Miss, Mrs. <laughs> Winslow's soothing syrup from the 1880s, which contained morphine. It produces a natural quiet sleep by relieving the child from pain, and the little cherub awakes bright as a button. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so... But for my pod podcast, I was mostly interested in identifying uses of opium as an analgesic. Um, and you'll often, again, you'll often read in modern blogs how the Hippocratic authors knew all about this. Um, and, and I say the Hippocratic authors because they were probably uh, compiled from 19 different writers of the period, 300 to 500 years before Christ. And yes, again, they, they described many florid concoctions that use opium and a handful of them that actually mention pain as being one of the symptoms treated. Um, but it's often one of many symptoms. So I think you know, it can be very hard to tell how specifically they were, they were targeting this. Um, so here's one example filed under diseases of women, uh, which deals with a presentation of ab abnormal discharges, edema and shortness of breath. There are two whole pages of dietary recommendations, douches, purgative potions and contraindications where before finally this advice is offered. If after all this, the woman says that the cervix is hard and painful, flush again with butter until the uterus dries and the patient recovers. On the days between these douches, have her drink a tonic of elderberries, rennet from a hare, the pod of a poppy, the median berry, and the fruit or shell of a sweet pomegranate all in equal parts. Mix this with barley meal and maiden hair to be taken on an empty stomach with fragrant red wine. Got to be good for something, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and that, that just like the, um, the whiskey treatment for influenza that's 
that Travis t- uh, will tell us about in our in our crossover episode of the. From, from, from I, I would love to have gone to a restaurant in those times if the sommeliers <laughs> or anything like the doctors. How amazing! Surely it was a um, cocktail waiter, right? No. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like I say, a bit of a rabbit rabbit hole. I really wanted to keep, make sure that I wasn't inferring what later writers had said versus the original authors. So I, I even went back to original Greek text um, to try and get the, the translations accurate. Um, and, and who knows whether taking poppy capsules like this would have had much effect as a painkiller or, or are they referring to the you know actual prepared opium milk? But maybe um, Alus Celsus was closer to the money. So He's around 50 AD. He's a Roman physician whose seven book De Medicina was um, was quite a popular text at the time. Mm. Although it's generally believed that he actually wasn't a physician, but a, himself, but more of an archivist. Again, there's an um, I've seen modern writers who say that Celsus recommends opium before surgery, but in the translation that I found, I couldn't. The two books on surgery are the only ones that don't mention opium, so I'm yeah. not entirely sure where that came from. Um, but just like Hippocrates, there are lots of crazy formulations that talk about poppy tears. So they're probably, he's probably talking about the milk now the, that comes out of the poppy capsule. Um, and they're sometimes used to treat things like inflammation, ulceration, ear infection, cough, which is a thing today. We know that codeine relaxes the respiratory system. But then Celsus very explicitly includes pain in the teeth. Which by itself can be counted as the greatest of all torments. But with these three remedies, the patient should carefully avoid swallowing the fluid in the mouth. So I think he wanted you to rub it into the teeth and the jaw. So again, I'm, oh. sh- I'm sh- shrugging my shoulders as to what benefit it could have had as an anal- analgesic. He also talks about bathing joints in the hands and feet when people develop persistent pains. Such as occurs in cases of podagra and chiragra, which are symptoms of gout, these seldom attack eunuchs or boys before coitus with a woman or women except those in whom the menses have become suppressed. So for any rheumatologist listening, please send us an email to confirm whether this is a likely uh, <laughs> mechanism of, of action. Eunuchs are immune to, to gout. Um, but anyway, these these funny ideas um, were surprisingly persistent, um, and the the strongest uh, model of, of of opioids use came from uh, a guy called Mithridates. Celsus was fond of using this treatment known as the antidote of Mithridates, named after the sixth king of Pontus. So this is first century BC in what's modern day Turkey. Uh, Mithridates was afraid of being poisoned and is said to have tested all sorts of antidotes on prisoners, one against henbane, one against snake venom, and then mixed them all up, why not, into a cure-all containing 48 (laughs) different ingredients, including poppy juice. Um, So Mm. poppy uh, opium was was one of many ingredients. Um, And Celsus and then later physicians just kept adding more components. So you also end up with frankincense and myrrh, cinnamon, earth from Lemnos, St. John's wort, bitumen or charcoal, hemp, chopped up skinks uh, to prevent against snake venom, curdled milk, carrot, anise, turpentine resin, roasted copper, and the musk secretions of the beaver. (laughs) <laughs> so this is the sort of stuff you find in the weird aisle in the chemist yeah, yeah. <laughs> where it says not pharmacy medicine <laughs> off the shelf um of course this tasted so foul that it was mixed into a paste with cinnamon and local pontic honey so that made it go down a, a bit easier a spoonful mm. of sugar after celsus nero's nero the nero the the violinist um yes. his court physician andromachus up to the opium content and swapped lizard for viper's flesh to in- increase the potency. Um, so not only did it counteract all poisons and bites of venomous animals, it would also relieve all pain, weakness of the stomach, asthma, difficulty of breathing, physis or tuberculosis, colic, jaundice, dropsy, weakness of sight, inflammation of the bladder and kidneys, and the plague. So, yeah, some of those... Um 
effects might be plausible for opiates. So this version of the potion became known as theriac, since theriakos is the ancient Greek word for beast. Uh, and, and we know and theriac becomes the term used for the next 1,700 years. Um, it's a, like you say, it sounds a bit like your top shop multivitamins today. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and there might be a grain of truth to some of these treatments. As historian Adrienne Mayo writes, the sulfur in garlic neutralizes arsenic in the bloodstream. Charcoal absorbs and filters many different toxins. Garlic, myrrh, cinnamon, and St. John, and St. John's water are antibacterial. Um, so, Travis, you're the pathologist. Is, is it plausible that small doses of venom could train the immune system to protect itself? Or? Well, we, already, we still do that to this day. Uh-huh. This is uh, immune therapy and there sort of uh, desensitization. So they're right. Um, we still use, I think there can be used charcoal as well to, yep. uh, to, to absorb some poisons. So <laughs> they must have been, they had, there's a seed of truth in there. Mm. Wow, that's like the drinks you offer when we visit your home. They're always a little bit bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's <laughs> left. That's right. <laughs> Although the end. Yeah, the antibacterial properties. Well, that would be interesting to to to, uh, to yeah. test out. But um, mind you, garlic and antibacterial. I don't know. So not sure about mm. some of them. Mm. But Mithridates did live to the ripe old age of seventy, um, yeah. according uh, according to Roman historian Pliny the Elder. But Pliny himself was sceptical that this was down to the medicine. The Mithridatic antidote is composed of fifty four ingredients, no two of them having the same weight while of some is prescribed one-sixtieth part of one denarius. Which of the gods, in the name of truth, fixed these absurd proportions? No human brain could have been sharp enough. It is plainly a showy parade of the art and a colossal boast of science. Go plenty. Yes. That's a burn if ever there were. were. What what did he really think? What did he really think? A roasting. Um... But Paul Pliny couldn't imagine just how entrenched this showy parade would become. In the second century after Christ, Galen of Pergamon wrote a whole book on theriac recipes, describing how it took 40 days to prepare and should be left for six years for maximum potency. Galen may have also documented for the first time the symptoms of withdrawal in his VIP patient, Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Historian Thomas Africa tells us how during a wearying military campaign on the Danube, Galen increased the dose to calm the emperor's nerves, but then at one point tried to go cold turkey. The translation goes like this. When he found himself getting drowsy at his duties, he had the poppy juice removed, but then he was unable to sleep at night. So he was obliged to turn again to the theriac, which contained poppy juice, since this had now become a habit with him. So it sounds like Galen knows what he's talking about, although... Some modern scholars doubt that the opium dose could have been high enough for independence to develop. Um, <clears throat> but I also wonder about uh, the difference between dependence and addiction. You know, if you're taking something with so much ritual to it, there's a, you know, likely to be something psychological going on as well. But yes, the theriac continued to be prescribed and tinkered with over many centuries. Um, other brand ambassadors included Charlemagne in the 8th century, Alfred the Great in the 9th. And I think it's important to signpost that much of our knowledge of ancient medicine and mathematics and philosophy comes thanks to the Islamic thinkers who preserved and transcribed the Greek and Roman texts during, during our Dark Ages, during the, <laughs> the Anglo-Dark Ages. Um, we know a lot about Galen's writing from the Persian physician uh, Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi, known in the West as Rajas. His Kitab al-Hawi, the comprehensive book on medicine, was written in the 10th century at the height of the Islamic Golden Age, and it contains these interesting references to opium. Anxiety is an ailment that affects the head. It is a type of anxiety with depression. If the condition worsens, paint the nostrils with opium. <laughs> For those with ulcers in the lungs, the medicines are made up of gentle astringents and of narcotics, such as henbane and opium. The quantity of narcotic is increased when there is a lot of catarrh with pain and sleepiness. Unless mixed with the beaver's musk, a drink of opium will be followed by a loss of appetite until the potency is weakened or lost altogether. Opium is cold and dry, a reference to the humours, perhaps. It is useful for diarrhoea, and for ulcers in the intestines. So interesting there, the loss of appetite. We know opiates cause constipation and 
I wouldn't know. No, never tried. <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> just the coding. Just the coding. <laughs> but another important figure is the Persian polymath Ibn Sina, who we know as Avicenna. His canon of medicine, Al-Kanun Fi Al-Tib, Fa'at-Tib, was published in 1025 AD and recommends opium for analgesia in chronic headaches, arthralgia, sciatica, toothache, gout, ear infection, blepharitis, urogenital pain, abdominal pain, and post-operative pain. He also had treatments involving willow oil, cannabis, and chamomile. Um, so, but I haven't found translations of, of, of those to see what kind of preparations we're talking about. Um, <laughs> I did find one excerpt which mentions three of Avicenna's formulations of Tirak, Tiryak al-Faruk, as he called it, intended to treat snake and scorpion bites, paralysis, epilepsy, leprosy, intestinal ulcers, ulcers as well as illnesses of the liver and spleen. <clears throat> and he says, he specifies that you can't just add any old viper. They need to live <laughs> far from damp places. A swamp or r- riverbank won't do. Um, and female snakes are more effective, of course. <laughs> the interesting part is how carefully he describes the dosing. And in this, I like, you know, brings a bit of the, what we're saying, there's the scientific method to it. So here's a translation, although the, this author from the Baskent Faculty of Medicine appears to have converted the units to modern units. Quote, In chronic cough, thoracic pain and pneumonia, 500 milligrams of it mixed with honeyed water is given to the patient consistently. If the patient has fever, this dosage should be mixed with rose water. If the patient has fever with chills, ague, malaria, and vomiting, this dosage should be mixed with water, or 90 milligrams of tyriac should be taken with 135 milligrams of wine. So yeah, it sounds a a little more scientific than what Galen was doing, and but like I said, each generation of physicians would take the, the theriac one step further. And by the 1500s, a doctor from the University of Padova called Pietro Mattoli has 125 ingredients in his version of theriac, including red coral and pearl. Um, fun fact about this Pietro Mattoli, he also made the first clinical description of a cat allergy, an important mm. breakthrough. Um, in England, the theriac went by the name of treacle because of its syrupy nature. So usually it was called Venice treacle um, where the, the, because that was where the top end stuff came from with a seal of authenticity from the Republic of Venice. But you, you could also buy it from Genova, Bologna, Padova, even Byzantium and Cairo, um, although I guess they were considered the cut price generics of their time. <laughs> the Ven- Venice treacle is what you wanted. The preparation of treacle became this public spectacle Um, The apothecaries who made it would lay out all the ingredients for inspection from officials and then mix them in front of the crowds. Um, You know, if only Big Pharma were this transparent with with their (laughs) research, right? Uh, The interesting twist is that in, in the early modern period, we see the birth of some institutions that we would recognize today. So in England, doctors would complain at the unreliability of foreign supply of theriac, or they were suspicious that they were getting sent the second-grade stuff from, from Italy. In response, the apothe- apothecaries in London started making treacle themselves, um, but to great surprise, it didn't always treat what it was supposed to, and then they themselves became came under suspicion. Um, you know, that, that it was their fault for they hadn't gotten the preparation right or they'd stored it incorrectly. And there was even que- a question as to whether swapping in local herbs for these exotic Mediterranean ones was undermining its eff- efficacy. So in 1540, we're now in the early modern period, a law was passed that regulated the manufacture of theriac and gave physicians the right gave physicians the right to search the apothecary shops for faulty wares, and and have them publicly destroyed if found to be defective, corrupted, and not meet not meet nor convenient to be administered in any medicines for the health of man's body. Uh, I'm sure the physicians of today would love this authority, and it was none other than Henry VIII who gave us this law. Um, and also a precursor to modern regulation in pharmaceutical prescribing. So, yeah, we've already heard how he founded the Royal College of Physicians. 
Henry's law for, forbade apothecaries, quote, to sell or prescribe any poisonous substance or drug to the body of any man, woman or child, save on the written prescription of a physician or upon a note in writing from the purchaser. So interestingly, while there was no pharmacy guild back then, the apothecaries, the apothecaries did have a lobby group in the form of the Grocers Hall and later the Worshipful Society of the Art and Mystery of Apothecaries. I think they should have stuck with that name. And they, they would go and complain in the House of Lords for their treatment at the hands of the College of Censors, the College of Physicians, and ask that there be a formally recognised recipe that would obviate the need for these undignifying inspections at the hands of the College. But there, there wasn't much sympathy for the apothecaries and production ended up being restricted to a single apothecary in London until 1618 when the first Pharmacopoeia Londinensis, or London Dispensatory, was published um, with a complete list of all the regulated and approved pharmaceutical recipes. Uh, so this is 1618, and the, the treacle is still the, the best and last treatment for, for plague, which was breaking out at the time. Uh, and, and when the, the pressure of the plague came along and more supply was needed, production actually got deregulated and, and many more uh, apothecaries were producing it. Uh, in 1666, uh, there was published one of the most famous medical texts, te texts in England, Ob Observationes Medicae by Thomas, Thomas Sydenham, who's known as the, the English Hippocrates. He was a big prescriber of treacle and also popularised a tincture of opium dissolved in sherry and spiced with cinnamon, cloves and saffron called laudanum. So you've, you've probably heard these lines before. So necessary an instrument is opium in the hands of a skilful man that medicine would be a cripple without it. And whoever understands it well will do more with it alone than he could well hope to do from any single medicine. To know of it only as a means of procuring sleep or of allaying pain or of checking diarrhoea is to know only the half of it. Like a Delphic sword, it can be used for many purposes besides. Of cordials, it is the best that has hitherto been discovered in nature. I had nearly said it was the only one. Very poetic lines. But believe it or not, Venice treacle didn't actually do much to cure the plague. So by the 18th century, the sheen was starting to wear off. It was now the age of reason, after all. Uh, and according to a history by the Wellcome Trust, a notable critic of the theriac was famous botanist Nicholas Culpepper, who described theriac recipes as terrible messes of altogether. And French chemist Nicolas Lemery also called out monstrous descriptions which only serve the purpose of throwing dust in one's eyes, making the composition very expensive and difficult to prepare. I like I like these the strength of, of feeling here. And in 1745 there was the release of a pamphlet called Antitherica, Essay on Mithridatium and Theriac. Uh, this was the first published work of a young Cambridge, Cambridge physician called William Heberden. Um, he's a fascinating character. He was the son of an innkeeper that showed great intellect and was sent to Cambridge at the age of 14 and became a remarkably observant physician. He later described differenti differentiating features of osteoarthritis and gout. He made a very detailed description of angina pectoris um, and had an interest in public health and hygiene around London water pumps. He identified chickenpox as distinct from smallpox and even prepared an inoculation strategy with Benjamin Franklin, name, name dropping there. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't get a copy of his uh, essay on against the theriac, um, although there is apparently an original in the National Library in Canberra I'd love to check out. But I've pieced together these quotes from other secondary sources. So in describing the theriac recipes, Henry Heberden wrote of... Injudiciousness the ostentation and wantonness of this heap of drugs. And he argued that the ill-considered mixing of so many exotic drugs resulted in, quote, medley of discordant simples, a dissonant crowd collected from many countries, mighty in appearance, but in reality, an ineffective multitude that only hinder one another. So I wonder if, you know, he's got a good sense of drug interactions by this stage. I mean, he said that at most the Therac would make you sweat and... Like like Pliny had already, he called BS on the mystical preparation and all the ritual involved. Um, and he also asked if the, uh, if the ancients 
if the ancient physicians only knew of three poisons at the time, how could it be valid today against so many more that now that science knew of so many other venoms? Um, so, he, you know, he suggests that each component should be tested one by one to prove this. Um, in trying to convince the College of Physicians to ban the theriac, Heberden leaned into a bit of flattery and jingoism for the college. Perhaps the glory of its first expulsion from a public dispensary was reserved to these times and to the English nation, in which all parts of philosophy have been so much assisted in asserting their freedom from ancient fable and superstition, whose College of Physicians, in particular, hath deservedly had the first reputation in their profession. Among the many eminent services which the authority of this learned and judicious body hath done to the practice of psychic, it might not be to the least that it had driven out this medley of discordant simples, made up of a dissonant crowd collected from many countries, mighty in appearance, but in reality an ineffective multitude that only hinder one another. So you'd, you'd think that it would be a slam dunk against the the use of this potion, but uh, the Galenic recipe for Theric still re reappeared in the London Pharmacopoeia in the following year, uh, although it was finally removed um, in the 70, 1788 edition. Um, and the last preparation ceremony of the classical Theric is recorded in 1790 in Paris. Even though in Europe it did persist into the 19th century uh, with indications for dyspepsia. Um, so, yeah, persistent idea. Hebberden comes across as a man of reason, ahead of his time perhaps, although I did find this sting in the tail. In the Wellcome Trust article, it appears there was a bit of a conflict of interest that he had his own variation of the recipe known as Hebberden's Ink, which remained in the British Pharmacopoeia until 1890. So even, even he, <laughs> even the greatest shuffle. You know, we, we're going from ancient times before the birth of Christ to to 1788, Travis, did, is there any other idea? You've you know you've written talked a lot about the humor theory and all sorts about the wacky treatments. Is there any one that has persisted so long in such a consistent form? The 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 humors are a, an example of something persisting, but we we even have it these days of uh, when a bit of knowledge is out there and people seem to lock onto it. It's hard to actually sort of rid people, and and this is uh, throughout. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch now have it. it. It's it's challenging to come up with examples, but sometimes it's uh, you know drinking sort of milk at night or you know having having certain things uh, makes you feel worse or makes this all sort of. Up. So once something gets into the consciousness, it seems to have a life of its own. And the humours, humours is a perfect example, again, much like uh, this concoction, that it took thousands of years for it to be, you know, uh, to be not necessarily dispelled, so to speak, but superseded as mm. knowledge. And this was the, you know, the best minds in ancient Greek that, that went up into the 1800s. Now, the theory of the humours is, is interesting because effectively that's talking about homeostasis. Uh, and so the balance of everything, and as soon as something becomes out of balance, which still kind of is, hmm. is what sickness and illness is, but it was just the completely wrong theory. Uh, and this is why we have sort of a different understanding. But yeah, certainly... Certainly, knowledge persisting, and this is this is why even examples today. If you put something in a patient history, chances are that will stay in their history for their life. And so, actually, even putting a query, you know, does this patient have this, can sometimes be misinterpreted, and it says this patient has this. Mm. Uh, and so, because there was no real way to test this, uh, sometimes, as we've discussed in previous episodes. Uh, the um, placebo effect is probably enough to actually make it seem like it is effective. And you just remind me, from my world of marketing, David Sandler wrote a magnificent book on sales in which he looks at how humans think and he tells a story of his wife putting a ham in the oven to roast and cutting the end off. And she, uh -huh. he asked why. Why? And she said, well, it makes it taste better. Huh. So at the next family, family gathering... He asked her mother, who did exactly the same thing, why she did it. She said it makes the ham taste better. You know, my mother's always done it this way. 
and he finally got to meet the great grandmother <laughs> um, and said, what's, this, what's the reason? Why do you cut the end off the ham? And she said, it wouldn't fit in the oven. <laughs> But yeah, and that goes to the point that uh, that Travis, you were getting at. Even when the scientific method comes into practice, you know, it started in the 14th century with William of Ockham through to Francis Bacon in the 17th. The even empiricism alone isn't enough, and we we know that today. There are many badly designed clinical trials, um, and you you talk in one of your podcasts about a guy who was tasting cancers and, and comparing it to the taste of red meat. For, so it's empirical, but it's way off. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I guess we need to... What's the message in that? That we need more humility about what we don't know? And I think it's just being more honest with, with everything, um, with, with patients. I, I think doctors now know that... Um, being honest with patients about what we know and what we don't, I think patients appreciate that. So, yes, it's actually knowing what we know, knowing what we don't know, and being able to distinguish between the two. Having gone on that deep dive into that story and having you just referenced, Mick, the, the researcher slash doctor tasting cancers, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just bring this segment to end with a quick tasting of what some of the other pomegranate episodes of interest are that you would suggest our listener uh, pursue and have a, a tasting of themselves? Sure, yeah. And so if, if your listeners like what they've heard, um, they might want to start with uh, episodes 67, 68 that were titled Gendered Medicine. So it, I was talking about why variation in care and outcomes for women in some conditions are so much worse than they are for men. And there's a bit of a fair bit of history there and cultural tropes that have influenced medicine and in a way that medicine has also influenced society because it is such a powerful institution. There's another one, episode 63, where I, which I recorded during the pandemic, which looks at how the World Health Organization came into being and, and then how its international sanitary regulations evolved from a couple of hundred years ago, how then they were applied during the pandemic. Um, so that starts back in 1851 with the International Sanitary Conference in Paris. And then there are lots of other episodes that are a little, a little bit more clinical or a little bit more practical about around professional practice. They're not all of them have such historical gems in them. So there's a, a sampling of some episodes to listen to, which I think are a lot more palatable than a tasting flight of cancer samples. <laughs> This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts on social media. Dr. Travis Brown can be found on X. His username is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's D-R Travis Brown. And Steve Davis can be found on LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash IN slash The Real Steve Davis. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production.